3k minus 4 theorem modulo a prime for large density sum says david all right well thank you uh, good morning to everyone good afternoon to everyone and good evening to everyone uh, i know these are difficult times so i'm very grateful that, uh, to have this invitation to be able to speak here uh, even though it's less than ideal uh, given the circumstances uh, we're making do as best we can and um, I actually met Balu only a, a year ago, and it was in India at a, a workshop there, a lovely workshop. Uh, and that was right before uh, COVID all hit much harder. And it was one of the last workshops or conferences that was able to take place uh, personally. Um, it was just afterwards, I remember flying back, and they were just putting in the mask mandates and other stuff. Uh, and uh, things hit much harder afterwards, and, and hopefully things will get much better soon. But we're, we're making do in the meantime. And the... Uh, the topic of this talk is going to be in uh, combinatorial number theory, and it's actually something related to uh, uh, things that happened at that last workshop. So I thought it an appropriate uh, topic for the talk at this uh, celebration here. So let's just start off with uh, some basic notation. So I'm going to be talking about some sets, and uh, some sets you may have seen before. Uh, we basically have some abelian group, and we're we're not studying the abelian group. We're looking at subsets A and B of this abelian group, and we define their sum or, or their sum set to be A plus B, all the little a plus little b with little a and a, and little b and b. And what, the type of results that I'm talking about are inverse types of results. So here I put on the a slide Freiman's theorem. This is perhaps one of the, the first uh, inverse results that was sort of proved in this area uh, way back in the, the middle of the last century. And uh, here's a formulation about over here. It's been generalized since uh, in many other variations, other such theorems as well. Uh, but basically, if you had like a set of in integers, so here we're considering finite, non-empty subsets. Uh, and if it has a small sum set, if the size of A plus itself is no more than a, a constant times the cardinality, uh, then the set has to have structure. Right? It, it has to be contained as a dense subset of a arithmetic progression, well, a multi-dimensional arithmetic progression which is just a sum set of uh, d different arithmetic progressions. And, and there are universal constants bounding the dimension and the density. Primus theorem has gotten a lot of attention. There's uh, lots of uh, important applications of it. Uh, I'm going to focus on a, a special case of Primus theorem. So in general, the bounds for Primus theorem are still a work in progress. And, uh, in general, you have multi-dimensional progressions. But if the sum set is small enough, and then you're guaranteed to not be uh, well contained inside a, an arbitrary multi-dimensional progression, but inside an ordinary arithmetic progression. And the bound which guarantees this is this 3k minus 4 bound. So here we have the, the statement over here. It was proved by Freiman back in 1959. It says if we have the, the cardinality of the sum set being, let's say it's r more than the sum of the cardinalities of a plus a, and we're sort of measuring the additive increment from uh, the sum of the cardinalities. And, this makes some sense because particularly for the integers, r is always going to be at least negative one because we have a trivial lower bound in the integer case. And we, we could put a negative one there or not. It's, it's never so clear whether to, whether to have r be, you know, so that it's at least zero or at least negative one. But the main thing is that afterwards, we have an upper bound of three times the cardinality minus four. And to explain the name in the original uh, work of a prime, and he let k denote the cardinality of a, and the upper bound was 3k minus 4. That's why it's sometimes called the 3k minus 4 theorem. And the result is that basically in these circumstances, A is uh, contained inside an arithmetic progression, ordinary progression. And there are exact bounds on the, the number of holes, the missing elements inside that progression, r plus 1. And this is one of the, the and a few examples where we have uh, actual exact bounds on just you know, how well contained A is inside that arithmetic progression. Uh, now, there's been many generalizations of this theorem since. Uh, here I put on the, the next slide on uh, one that works for distinct summits. So not just A plus A, but A plus B. And it's going to become important later on for what I'm talking about. Uh, and this, uh, well, in various forms, was proved either by Freiman or by levin Spelansky or by Stanchescu. Uh, so it has a bit of a longer history. Uh, Freiman has a, an original paper in Russian, which isn't quite as well known as some of his other papers, proving a, something close to this, at least partially this. It is all in Russian. Um, then Levin Spelansky gave a, a variation on this result uh, involving the diameter of the sets. And, and Sanchesco later on sort of gave a, a short little observation that you can prove this larger 
uh, this result that was more similar to Freiman's result uh, from the version of Levitch Bilansky. And the statement is basically here we have the same R additive constant above the sum of the cardinalities. And now the 3K minus 4 theorem is more or less the sum of the cardinalities plus the min cardinality minus 4. And in that case, the sets A and B are both well covered by arithmetic regressions with the bounds being tight. And uh, as I said, they're, they're tight. Well, here's an example showing why those bounds are tight. There are, of course, two bounds that there are. One is the hypothesis, which is saying that you can't go beyond 3K minus 4. So over here, if we just took A to be a union of two arithmetic progressions, then we space them really far apart. Let's say the arithmetic progression with difference one. Uh, then when we add A to itself, well, we would do a short little calculation, and it would be exactly three times the cardinality of A minus three. And there'd be no way to bound the number of folds because we could keep on pushing the arithmetic progressions further and further apart. And as a small variation, we could take A being the union of those two arithmetic progressions, difference one, far apart, and B being a single arithmetic regression difference one. And when we add them together, we find the sum set at cardinality A plus two B minus two. And that's just one off from the from being a, an optimal lower bound. Uh, and, and we can uh, slightly modify the statement for distinct sum ends to sort of take in this into account. But in this talk, to avoid those technicalities, I'm not going to deal with that too much. Uh, here's the other bound, right? The, the bound on how many holes the progression has to have. So I've done, done it as a little picture over here. So you can imagine the, the dark dots are supposed to be the elements of the set. And the, the circles, the open dots, should be the missing elements, the holes inside the set. So we have over here the, the arithmetic progression, which is well containing the set A of cardinality little a. We have an arithmetic progression, the same difference one, uh, contain, well containing this uh, set B, and there are the R plus one holes inside it. And when you add them together, you get a set that looks more or less the same. Again, there's a a long length arithmetic progression at the beginning, some of the cardinalities minus one, and then R plus one holes afterwards. Uh, so this basically shows you you can't beat R plus one for the number of holes unless we sort of modify the statement of the theorem somehow. And there's, a, there's an important observation we cut about that, that final sum set set. So what if I took its complement? So here I'm just replacing every dark dot with a white dot. So we're looking at the complement of the sum set inside Z. And of course, since we're inside Z, the, it stretches out all the way to the left, off to infinity and all the way to the right to infinity. Uh, but you can sometimes imagine, well, what if you sort of loop things around? Z is like a very long line, but it's, it's very typical to sort of loop that line around into a circle. And if you did that, then you sort of have a, a long length arithmetic progression starting here and zooming all the way off to infinity and back down here. A long length arithmetic progression followed by a portion with a small number of holes, r plus one holes. So, in some sense, uh, the sum set is also well, it's complement, well contained inside an arithmetic progression if you sort of allow um, it to contain, pass through the point at infinity. This is going to be important. So, here's another version. So, this was uh, in the symmetric case A equals B proved by Freiman. Uh, and then uh, sort of updated to the distinct sum in case by Barbachi and myself. So we have the same hypothesis of the 3K minus 4 theorem, and I've normalized so that zeros inside both sets. That is, there's no bearing really, except to simplify some notation. And then we have the same conclusions of the 3K minus 4 theorem, except that we gain something else. The sum set has a long length arithmetic progression, at least the sum of the cardinalities minus one, just like in that example. That's why that actually shows this bound is tight. And uh, like I mentioned, if you take the, the complement of uh, the sum set, and I'm going to throw a little negative sign there, though it may or may not be clear why I'm doing this, but if you take the complement of the sum set, uh, that's well contained inside the complement of the arithmetic progression. With the most R plus one holes. These are basically equivalent statements when you do a short calculation. And while R isn't an arithmetic progression inside Z, it's close to being one. And this is, uh, this, is this third set that's sort of a having a, a symmetric almost relation as this two other sets A and B, even though it does have infinite cardinality, this complement of A plus B. So that's all the stuff inside the integers. And the title of this talk involves uh, some sets mod P. So let's move to uh, modular prime. And there we currently have, uh, well, it's conjectured, that there should be a version of this 3K minus 4 theorem that holds modular prime. 
are also probably versions module non-primes. There's been some recent advances of uh, giving results for non-primes too, uh, but this talk is going to focus on the primes. Where we, we've had yet even better balance than what we have currently for the, the composite case. Um, and the exact statement of the conjecture is probably still a little hazy, but this is probably the best that we can hope for if this conjecture is going to be true. Uh, so again, we have the our, a single subset A, which is what I'm focusing on for the this talk. It has R more than the sum of the cardinalities. It's the most 3A minus 4. And uh, you'll notice we have a, a, a density assumption. The sum set can't be too large because, of course, if it was very close to the entire size of the group, we'd expect the behavior, the similarity between Z mod PZ and the integers to break down. And, and our best hope was that it would hold all the way up to P minus 4 minus R. So, so nearly density one with a minus R term here afterwards. And uh, of course, the conclusion is that A is well covered by an arithmetic regression. And now the complement of the sum set as well is well covered by an arithmetic regression, which is, of course, equivalent to A plus A containing a long length arithmetic regression. And there's a typo there. There, there is no B. B is A. Uh, I, I work so often with distinct summons uh, that I sometimes just automatically write a B there. So to explain where that bound P minus R minus four is really coming from, uh, let's talk about something that goes back as far as I know to, to Vosper. Well, there may be earlier instances. Uh, I just know that I, there are references to this in, in Vosper, at least in some form. And so for here on, I'm gonna use this bar notation to denote the complement of the set, whatever it's barred over. So X bar is the complement of X inside the larger abelian group G, which for us was going to be Z mod PZ in general. But here, this result just holds for any finite abelian group. And then we say we have two pairs of subsets, A and B, and their sum is R more than the sum of the cardinalities. So we're using this R as this additive increment over the size uh, of the original sets. We set C to be our third set, the complement of A plus B negated. And then uh, a very basic observation shows that A plus C is contained inside negative complement B, and B plus C is contained inside negative complement A. And we have these upper bounds that A plus C, it's the size of the set is no more than the sum of the cardinalities of A plus C plus R. And the same thing with B plus C. So that if A plus B has small cardinality with regards to this R, then so will the, these other two sum sets, A plus C and B plus C. And so in some sense, the, this pair A plus B is just one pair out of three. You know, we have actually three sets, A, B, and C, and you can look at any one of those pairs and they all have small sum set and they're, they interact with each other. And this interaction, we can take advantage of it, and we're going to. Uh, when we talk about what we're going on in this, this talk later on, it's going to be how we achieve uh, some of the, the improved bounds. And the P minus R bound comes from this uh, little observation. If we have the sum set of A plus B being at most P minus R minus four, well, that's the same thing as saying the cardinality of the third set C is at least R plus four. And so A plus C is at most A plus C plus R, that, it's really A plus 2C minus 4, which is that same bound, that 3K minus 4 bound for distinct summons. So in some sense, this, this P minus R4 bound is simply saying we have the hypotheses of the 3K minus 4 theorem, not just for A plus A, but also for A plus C. And A, well, in this case, A plus C a second time, because we have A is equal to B. So all the, the two choices of pairs, uh, two sets of three pairs are going to satisfy the 3K minus 4 bound. And so that's some explanation as to why we might hope this would be the best. And of course, there are examples showing we, we can't go beyond this bound. Uh, simply taking that like that two-dimensional arithmetic regression and, and considering it module the appropriate time. So let's talk a little about where what we do know about this conjecture when it's true, because there's been a lot of partial progress. And so I'd like to talk a little about some of the cases where we know that the, the conclusion is true. And in many of these cases, they, they only talk about the, the containment by an, an arithmetic regression. But uh, now that we have the results for the integers uh, that allow the, the, this version of the 3K minus four theorem that says there's a long length arithmetic progression inside a, something below the 3K minus four bound, that also is enough to guarantee that all those older results that only gave containment, they now automatically also give the second half of the theorem. There's the, the third set is also well contained. This can all be easily shown. So maybe we should start with the, the first result of Fryman. Here, he was not able to prove the, the entire conjecture. In fact, there, there, 
was no conjecture back then. This is the sort of the source of the style of result. And they sometimes call the Feynman 2.4 theorem, although uh, the method yields different constants. But basically the idea is that if you have a stronger small doubling restriction, so it's not at most 3a minus 4, it's now 2.4 times a minus 3. And you have a stronger density restriction. It's not all the way up to P minus that R constant. It's density 0 0.02. These, these aren't tiny numbers, but they're not ideal numbers either. They're sort of moderate size numbers. They're, they're reasonable numbers, not, not minuscule, but also not ideal. And under these conditions over here, the theorem is true. Uh, originally, it was just the, the containment by an arithmetic progression. But as I mentioned now, that, that now implies the, the long length arithmetic progression as well. So the third set is also long length. Um, and the methods from this paper over here are going to be important because we're going to use the similar methods to what Priman used in his original 1961 paper. Now, uh, there are other results too. So an observation or some Bilou, Lev, and Rusha, they have a whole paper where they talk about uh, methods of how you can reduce uh, well, basically, uh, from a finite group, say mod p, into the case of the integers, and rectification arguments, as they're sometimes called. If a set is sufficiently small, then in some sense it's isomorphic; it behaves no differently than an integer subset. This can be made uh, very formal. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, but basically, when the set is say log p in size, then it it's the same thing; it behaves the same way as an integer subset. And there's an isomorphism, a prime and isomorphism between that subset and an integer sum set. And then you could apply the results for the integers to study the set. And so we have the result for the integers up to 3k minus 4. So you can apply that result there and then pull it back via the isomorphism to get the result mod p with a bound of log p. So this is, of course, uh, not a density result, it's, but it is some bound that says if a is at least not too big, then the theorem would be true, all the way up to doubling constant 3. So moving back on to say improving on what Freiman did, something where we have moderate sizes and the, the doubling restriction and also on the density, uh, Rodsef basically improved a little on the, the calculations that Art Freiman did. Uh, Freiman was, was a little sloppy with some of his Fourier calculations. One of his main innovations he was using was to use Fourier analysis uh, combined with combinatorics to give this result. And he was maybe not as uh, not as precise uh, with the, the calculations for giving the estimates for the Fourier coefficients uh, than Rodsip was. And so just by being a little bit more careful, you can get uh, quite an improvement in the actual calculations. It went from 0.02 to 0.09. And I'll carry on basically with this idea of rectification. We have Green and Rusha who gave a sort of a different one. So the idea that was used in that paper of Bilu, Levin, Rusha was that, you know, the set was very small, any set, it's some that would be guaranteed to be isomorphic to some integers. Uh, here, the idea between this paper here was to use results uh, that would give, well, depending on the, yes? What was there a question? Okay. Uh, something depending upon the doubling constant. And so here it is small doubling, doubling constant of three. And so based upon that, they could give something that was uh, a density result, some A times, uh, you know, a constant times P. And of course, the constant was, was very small, though. So something like 4 times 10 to the negative 72. So there's a lot of zeros there before we get to the P. Uh, but it's a linear bound, a very small linear bound. So this is certainly less than ideal because in many applications, it's important that the we be able to consider dense subsets. Uh, but that widens the range where these, these results can be approved, applied, and, and sometimes we really need to buy them for dense sets. So this result gives us a doubling constant all the way up to three. It's a density result, but it's, it's so tiny that it's, it's not always applicable. Now we can go to the opposite extreme. What if we were trying to get the optimal density bound? So we have some uh, nice work of Serra and Seymour. Uh, they got the optimal density bound, p minus r minus four. But of course, there was a, they had to pay a little bit of a cost for that. And they had to weaken that small sum set hypothesis from, say, what Freiman had at 2.4 to 2.0001. So it's not minuscule, not like something like four times 10 to the negative 72, but it's uh, far from the, the, the level of, uh, it's far away from being three anyways. 
So there's still work to, to be improving in that bound there, but it, it is the optimal density. It's the, one of the few results that actually would apply in a large density setting. It's been very hard to get results applicable in large density settings, and their result goes up to the conjecture bound. And uh, in a sort of related result there, there's a, another result of myself, uh, which you might, when you first look at it, it says, well, you can get doubling constant 3k K minus 4. And you can get density P minus R minus 4. So it's basically the whole conjecture, but you have to add one extra restriction. So it's not the whole conjecture. Right? You need R to be dense inside P. So again, and that density bound R has to be no more than some really small constant times P. 3 times 10 to the negative 15, 49, and just a rough estimate, it's going to be minuscule. So this is an order of the similar stuff uh, as to what's coming out of the Green and Roosh arguments. Uh, and But at least we get both at the same time, and it's saying that at least for a sufficiently large P, in comparison to how much we're in incrementing over the, the size of A plus A, the, the theorem will be true. So th there is some evidence, uh, some hope anyways, that the, the full conjecture might be true, and, and although we're still working on how, how dense we can make the sets. So we could talk a little bit about that, that density bound, because that density bound depends upon uh, that additive, additive increment R. And so that you have P minus R, what if you wanted a bound that didn't depend upon R? So, I mean, here we have the, the hypotheses we have. We, let's write R as being some constant alpha times the cardinality minus four. And so then since we have this, this bound being two A minus R being at most three A minus four, that's equivalent to saying A is between at most one. And it's going to be at least zero because it's always at least negative one uh, because where we have the, the Cauchy Davenport theorem, if you're familiar with it. But RR is going to have you have a similar lower bound as you have for Z. And if you did a short calculation, you'd see that this popped out of it. So I've done the calculation up here, but you can jump right to the end if you'd rather. Uh, the sum set has this sort of density two alpha divided by two times one plus alpha uh, times P plus four, and then the whole thing minus four. But it's basically a density two plus alpha times two over one plus alpha. And you could ask, well, if you want a bound that's independent of R, so they're independent of the, this, this doubling constant, right? this, it works for all sets inside the range applicable to the 3K minus four theorem. Well, what will be the smallest this upper bound could be? And a short calculation shows alpha equals one, where you have density basically at 3A minus four. And there it becomes three quarters P. So, in a, a weak sense, anyways, three quarters p is the the optimal density for for the uh, the prime and three k minus four theorem modulo of prime. I mean, obviously, we, we still expect to get something more like density p minus that, that constant r. Uh, but if we want something that's a bit applicable, that a, a uniform bound for all possible doubling constants inside this range, then we wouldn't be able to beat three and three quarters p. And so uh, we're going to talk about for the, the rest of this little talk here uh, what we can do under these density assumptions and. Uh, prior to our work over here, the only result that would be applicable in this range was the result of uh, Uriel, uh, Sierra, and, and, and Zimor. And so that was this one that went up to the optimal density of P minus R minus 4. And it had a doubling constant basically 2 plus 0. 0.0001. So it, it's at least something, not minuscule, but still pretty small. We, we wanted to improve that. Uh, and here's the, the improvement we were able to manage. So again, we have here now the same hypotheses as the 3K minus 4 theorem mod P. And you can see we have the density restriction as being 3 quarters P. So that's up to this uh, semi-optimal, this, this rough approximation of the optimal density. And our restriction is going to be a, dense, uh, a small sum set hypothesis of about 2.1368. Uh, so you know, in comparison to 2.00001, uh, this is a lot better. It's getting closer to that sort of like 2.4 level that we had from Fryman's original result, a little bit less, but we have much higher density. And the conclusion again is we get the, the desired conclusion. A is well covered by an arithmetic regression, type bounds, and of course, by the current machinery, that automatically implies that the, the third set, the negative of the, the complement of, again, that should be A plus A, uh, is well covered by an arithmetic regression as well. Same bounds. So let's talk a little bit about how we, uh, we got this improvement. So 
one of the key ideas was to, uh, we're going to follow the general approach anyways of Fryman back from that paper in uh, maybe whatever, around 1960, 1961. Uh, and so the, the idea of that paper was, uh, well, to use Fourier analysis. And so, and using Fourier calculations and, and you know, putting the points on the circle was able to show that, you know, if, you know, given that, that hypothesis about having small sum set, that forced there to be a, a large sub sum set, some A plus B contained inside A plus A. So A prime is inside A and B prime is inside A. I didn't sort of write that down formally, but that, that's the case. So we have a, a large sub sub set contained inside A plus A. And it's isomorphic to an integer sum set. So, and well, I talked about this informally before, one way we can really have a, a simple isomorphism is say A is contained inside a, a short length arithmetic progression. Uh, a prime and B prime as well. So let's say we have A contained inside some interval, a, interval, a difference uh, one, or say difference D, and length, uh, I don't know, P minus one over two. And the same thing for B prime, right? So we basically we start at X plus zero, then D, two D up to P minus one over two, and the same thing for B. And if we were to add A plus B, that, that whole set is gonna live between X plus Y, then plus zero, plus D, plus two D, all the way up to, well, P minus one. So we're never actually looping around inside mod P. Right? We don't have to use the fact that P is equal to zero modulo P. Uh, addition in this setting over here is gonna basically be the same as if we had added with just ordinary integers. And so in that sense, we can simply lift these sets directly up to the integers and just apply the results for the integers, get the results there and then push them right back down. And they're gonna hold in, in the original set Z mod PZ with respect to this difference. And of course, we, we have to have some difference D because uh, unlike the sort of canonical differences for the Z, we have one and negative one uh, for mod PZ. Well, we have any uh, non-zero difference is going to give us uh, an arithmetic regression that covers the whole group. And so the, the Fourier arguments basically get A, and B, A prime and B prime contained inside short length arithmetic progressions. Progressions that have length at most uh, half the order of the group and we can't get the entire set of A inside the short arithmetic progression, but we get a large subset. And uh, that's sort of the, the start, the, the kernel of the argument, right? Uh, and of course, we're gonna use the, the better estimates of Rodseth for doing those Fourier calculations uh, so that we, we don't lose any loss there. And then uh, afterwards, we then that's when the combinatorics takes over. So all the more discrete arguments. So, we're going to consider a sub sum set A prime plus B prime contained inside A plus A. And it should be isomorphic to an integer sum set. So it's well contained inside these, these uh, short length arithmetic progressions of, uh, say, length no more than P over two. And we want to consider one that has the sum of the cardinalities A prime plus B prime being max. So, of course, we, since we have a, a large such one by this Fourier analysis approach, uh, well, we can consider one that's maximal and it will also be large. And just because the notation is symmetric, we can assume that B prime is the, the smaller of the two cardinalities. Uh, I, I should mention that inside the original work of Freiman, uh, a, B prime was always equal to A prime. And so here we're doing a, a slight variation. We're actually allowing the two sets to be different to give us some more flexibility. Uh, and this is actually going to help us improve the constants by having this extra flexibility. So it may not be immediately evident why I was starting off from even, from a, even from the symmetric case when A is equal to, when to B is equal to A, we're, we're adding A to itself. A Y passing to two distinct sets can actually give us better constants, but it does. It allows us some flexibility to move around and we're gonna incorporate that third set. And uh, well, let, let's talk about what we do with this bound. So the, the basic idea of, of Freiman was that well, we don't have the optimal small sum set hypothesis for A plus A. Instead, we have some hypothesis that, you know, in our case here, it's at most 2.1368 times the cardinality minus four. Well, I think it should be minus three, but regardless. Uh, so we get something that's, you know, A has a strong or small sum set hypothesis. Now, A prime plus B prime is, is contained inside A plus A. So we have this trivial upper bound. It's, it's no more in size than the sum of A plus A. I mean, ideally we would expect it to have much smaller size. But it's kind of hard to show that right from the start. If we could do that, we could actually improve the calculations a little, but even though we would certainly expect this to, to show this is, is harder. So 
we have this trivial bound. Because it's much smaller than the 3k minus 4 bound, uh, if we actually go into the details of how much smaller, out pops uh, the 3k minus 4 bound for a prime and b prime, what we get for distinct signs. So, of course, uh, you have to do a calculation, and it's exact those what comes out of those forward calculations that gives the right amounts that, with regards to the small sum set, they interact with each other. So, there's a lot of calculations going on to get the, the numbers to work out. But when everything is chosen appropriately, out pops the hypothesis we get to apply the, the 3k minus 4 theorem in Z to A prime plus B prime. And remember, they're isomorphic to an integer sum set. So, we're allowed to do this. We can take the isomorphic copy, apply the result for the integers. Get the structure for the isomorphic copy of a prime plus b prime, and then that pull that back to the the actual a prime plus b prime via the isomorphism. And the isomorphism is very simple. We're just basically, you know, if this is our set there where zero is going to zero, d is going to one, and so on. And the the three k minus four theorem tells us that a prime and b prime are well contained inside an arithmetic progression. And in this case, it would be one with difference one. And so that would translate to that arithmetic regression with difference D that we started with. A prime and B prime were both contained in one that was, was short, no more than half the size of the group. Well, now it's much smaller. It's something that depends upon the doubling constant. And so we shrink that interval drastically. So we have now A prime and B prime contained in even shorter intervals, say X plus, I don't know, zero to M, but it could be even if we translate things appropriately, uh, contained inside that original interval, uh, zero to P over two. Although we may have to translate the intervals, doesn't matter. Let's keep things simple. So if we actually had a prime and b prime both being equal to a, we'd be done. Right? Because then we'd have the entire set a itself well covered by an arithmetic progression, and then that would also give us the, the corresponding result for the the complement by the result in z as well. So there has to be some element that's missing, something that's not inside a prime or, or something that's not inside b prime. It's an element of A that's not contained inside that, that interval from 0 to M or from 0 to N. Now, Z has to be kind of far away from the endpoints of that interval because if Z was inside an interval of length P over 2 that included that interval from 0 to M, well, we could add Z to A prime. And we still have a, a subset, a larger one than A prime that contained all of the previous set of A elements of A prime plus one new element, all inside an arithmetic regression of difference. Uh, D and length at most one half of P. It would rectify. It would have the isomorphic to an integer sum set, and we would contradict the maximality of A prime and B prime. Well, that can't happen. Z has to be kind of far away from the endpoints, zero and M, and also zero and N. Wow. And it, it turns out that if, if we had a density assumption about P, P over two, so one half, then being far away from the endpoints would easily be able to show that the difference in cardinalities between A plus A and A prime plus B prime was big enough. We, we'd make up for that difference and we get a contradiction right away. And we just, we, we gain lots of new elements. Uh, it would be much bigger than A prime plus B prime and it would just be too large for our hypothesis. The complete proof would end right away and we'd be done. The problem is, of course, these simple arguments for density one half break down at one half. So we need something new, something to push it beyond one half to get closer to, to three quarters. That's what our, we're going to do. So we need a new trick. Something to get better, right? Because we need to, you know, pass up from one half to three quarters where we need to go basically 50% further. So we need something else that's going to give us that, that distance. And surprisingly, we're, we're not going to need, a, we're going to just need a, a simple little, some simple little combinatorial stuff involving that observation of uh, Bosper from uh, back in the middle of the previous century. So we'll start off with a calculation. I, I'm not going to give the calculation, but a short little calculation using some of those results from Bosper shows that if we add A prime to the set of third set, so minus A prime plus A complement, uh, it satisfies the 3K minus 4 hypothesis. Now, of course, these are subsets of Z mod PZ, so we're not guaranteed we can apply the 3K minus 4 theorem to these sets, but if we could, they certainly satisfy the, the bound that would be necessary to do it. So this is a good start. And of course, uh, since A prime plus B prime is contained inside A prime plus A, remember B prime is contained inside A, uh, we could take their complements and that swaps the order. That means negative A prime plus A complement is contained inside negative A prime plus B prime complement. So we just, when we take a complement, the, the order of inclusion swaps. 
And we notice that that A prime plus B prime complement, that's the third set. Inside the three K minus four theorem for that integer sum set, A prime plus B prime. Now that's something that's isomorphic to the integers. We, that third set is, is available in the integers. It's the, it's the sort of the missing one, which uh, contains, uh, if we took its complement, a long length arithmetic progression, or when we take its complement, so this third set, it's also well contained inside an arithmetic progression. It's contained inside a short arithmetic progression. And so um, A prime plus A complement is also contained inside a short length arithmetic progression because we have this inequality here. So if the, the third set from our integer sum set is well contained inside an arithmetic progression, then this set is too. Well, that's nice. We do another calculation. Well, it turns out it's, it's small enough. The length of that progression is small enough to guarantee that a prime plus uh, negative a prime plus b complement, right, that's also going to rectify. That's isomorphic to an integer sum set. It's, so it's, since they're both a prime, the interval length containing a prime and the interval containing this set over here, they're small enough that we never overlap past p. We don't have to use the fact that p equals zero. It's an integer sum set. It obeys the 3k minus 4 theorem by the, the calculation at the beginning. And so we can apply the 3k minus 4 theorem now to this set, a prime plus the negative of a prime plus a complement. And this uh, inclusion here, that's that observation of a Vosper from the middle of the last century. It's, this is all contained inside negative a complement. Because uh, if we sort of did this around, this is a prime plus a, that's the third set for that, that trio. So what we do, we apply the 3k minus 4 theorem to a prime plus uh, this third set, negative a prime plus a complement. And we use that result of Bardachi and myself, that there's a long length arithmetic progression inside there, inside the integers. So P is contained inside there, and therefore contained inside negative A complement two. It's dissolved via the isomorphisms going on in the background. We take complements, and we get A contained inside a negative P complement. Now, P is a long length arithmetic progression, so the complement of P modulo P is going to be a short length arithmetic progression. We do another calculation. It turns out it's short enough to guarantee that a plus a prime plus a rectifies that it's isomorphic to an integer sum set. This is, this is nice. So this would actually give us a contradiction right away because we're, we're assuming that a prime plus b prime was the maximum of such uh, set that did this that would be isomorphic to integers inside a plus a. So the only way we don't get a contradiction is if b prime equals a. But B prime is the smaller set, right? So if B prime equals A, then A prime equals A. And the only way we, we don't get the contradiction to the maximality of our rectifiable subsum set A prime plus B prime is if A prime equals B prime equals A. And so the entire sum set rectifies. It's isomorphic to the integers and therefore reduces directly down to the integers where we have those results available to us. So that's the, the basic idea of the proof and how it we were able to sort of leverage that that observation and this, this trio set flipping back and forth uh, to push and to actually uh, cir circumvent the, this, the density restriction one half, the, to actually extend that argument and get it to three quarters. And in the remaining time that I, I sort of have in this talk, I'd like to talk about some applications of this result. So uh, the result itself is, uh, is quite nice, I think, in, anyways, for in and of its own right, but uh, we gave a few short, simple examples, some things to show what you can do with the result afterwards. And so one of the ones I want to talk about, which is kind of what led me to talk about this particular topic at this conference, is something involving some free sets. So let's just say we have a subset A of an abelian group. It's said to be some free if when we take it some set A plus A, it's disjoint from A. So there's no element inside A that can be written as the sum of two other elements of A. So it's some free. And these are very old, uh, well-studied sets going back to shore, uh, studied a lot by Erdős and other sense. Uh, they're a very popular topic. Uh, and here's an example of a, a sum-free set. We could take, say, the middle third interval mod p. So say everything from p plus one over three to two p minus one over three. And we'll assume p is, has the right congruence mod three for this to work out. And if we look at a plus a, then, well, we have an interval sum with itself, so we get a, a longer length interval. So everything from 2p plus 2 over 3 to 4p minus 2 over 3. And since we're, we're in mod p, that, that loops around. 
We get basically everything from 2p plus 2 over 3 to p, and then that's 0. And we go all the way up to, to p minus 2. But you notice that we never hit the middle third of the interval when we do this. Right? p minus 2 is just shy of, of p plus 1 over 3. So the a plus a is disjoint from a, and we get an example of a sum free set of cardinality p plus 1 over 3, basically density 1 third. And so this, it's a, a large density sum free set mod p. Now uh, you could ask, well, could you do better than this? The answer is no, because we do have this, uh, this lower bound mod p. If we have a, a set which doesn't equal the entire group modulo p, well, then we have the Cauchy Davenport bound. It says the, the size of a plus a is at least two times the cardinality minus one. Um, just like for the integers. And so if a is sum free, then of course a plus a is disjoint from a. So the, the, some of the cardinalities of a plus a and a's. Is, no more than all the elements inside the group, no more than P. Maybe that won't even be possible. It is possible, for instance, in this example here. We get this trivial upper bound. We apply the Cauchy Davenport theorem to estimate the A plus A from the below, and we get 3A minus 3. And so that rearranges to saying A has the size of most P plus 1 over 3. That's, uh, so density one third is really optimal. So um, just like we can ask for a structural results. Uh, for some sets, we could ask for structural results for some free sets too. Why not? You know, there's an optimal density, a maximal density that a sum free set can have mod p. So, what do the sets look like that are close to that optimal density? Well, this was a question that was actually, I think, first looked at by Lev. Uh, and then it was later improved by Deshoyes and Freiman. And then uh, Lev and Deshoyes got together and uh, proved an even better cost. So, what it basically says is that if we have a, a, a dense subset of A, so we're, we're not quite at optimal, the, the maximal density 0 0.3333, we're a little below that, 0 0.318 times P. And if some A is some free, then it, it can't be an arbitrary set, it has to have some kind of structure. And the structure is that it's a dilate of not the middle third interval, but we're allowed to stretch the interval a little bit more as the size of A uh, you know, changes and gets smaller. So it's maybe the, the cardinality of A to P minus A, and we dilate, dilate it by D, that's A is contained somewhere inside. It's you know a larger length middle interval. And of course, we have to dilate by D because we have not not only in arithmetic progressions with difference one, but those with difference two, three, four, up to P minus one, which all are symmetric inside the Z mod PZ. So we can take the middle portion of any one of those intervals with difference, whatever it might be, any non-zero difference. And I'm using D dot X to re represent the, the, the dilation of X. So D times X, so it's, you know, we take any element of X, little X inside big X and multiply it by D. We're just dilating. Uh, so, like I said, this has been a, the, this was sort of the result of a, a sequence of various other improvements in the bounds, and you could use our result fairly, fairly straightforwardly to get a little bit of an improvement. So we, we can improve the, the bounds that were given by Desoyers and Lev, and we can improve that from the, this 0.318 to 0.313. And uh, like I said, this is what, what motivated me a little to talk about this because uh, at this conference in India just over a year ago, right, right before all Corona hit and everything. Uh, we were just wrapping up this paper, myself and Pablo and, uh, and Gonzalo Sanchez, is one of his students, and we were doing the final revisions uh, before it was going to be published, uh, and there was a talk by, uh, at the conference, too, involving these, this concept of these inverse, inverse results for some free sets, where they were talking about this older result of Deshoyes and Lev, and also about some, some work they were, that was in progress. So it's, it's even possible that this bound that I've put it up here is, has been improved since then. Uh, I, I checked to see if I could find a paper online because I, I, I think they were they were currently working on this project in the meet. Uh, so I don't know, it may not be finished yet, but there, so there may be some even, even some better notes afterwards where this bound of 0.313 can be improved even more afterwards. But uh, in comparison to what was currently published, we were able to improve it from 0.318 to 0.313. And so we were kind of happy with that. It was, it was a nice, simple application. And it was basically just directly applying our, our result because, you know, once you have this, this high density result, that, that gives you a, a strong, uh, an upper bound using, so we don't have Cauchy Davenport, but we have our result instead. And you get the structure there and can apply the long length arithmetic progression we get inside Z uh, to basically turn it into that, that long length interval right there. So the, the details here follow pretty straightforwardly afterwards. Uh, we also gave a different application of this. It's sort of a, a variation. So we have something in, in called an M sum free set. So now we, we define uh, a set to be m sum free. m is just some integer that's at least one. If the sum set 
A plus B is disjoint from the diamond dilation of A. So you can't write uh, any M times something at A as a sum of two other elements. So of course, if M is equal to one, this corresponds to being sum free. And you could ask, well, let's list a, to set down here this DM of Z mod PZ to be the maximal density of a M sum free set mod P. Right? So, so if we do this over here, then basically, and we let P get really large, see what happens uh, for larger and larger primes. This density uh, for the one case, the, the sum free case, uh, that's one third. It's that simple observation. You just write down the lower bound construction. We have the Cauchy Davenport bound, done. And uh, if you went on to two, well, then actually this condition about being m sum free or two sum free, you're trying to avoid two term arithmetic progressions. And that's hard to do uh, for a positive density set. So it, the density goes to zero in this case. Uh, kind of a more deeper result involving you know, arithmetic progressions. So let, let's set uh, dm to be the maybe the limit uh, with this density is approaching for m at least uh, three. So we get some estimates for dm. So that was kind of the some of the motivation uh, that was actually my, my two co-authors were very much interested in, and we were able to use the, this result uh, to get some improvements here. So, uh, for instance, they had previously used that result of Florio, uh, Serra, and uh, Zimor to give a, an improvement on this. this constant DM in the, in the past, but they, it was 2.0001, it was pretty small. Uh, so the constant wasn't quite as ideal as they liked. And it was actually at another conference in Shanghai where I met Pablo and he was talking about the result they had uh, with the constant, you know, the result of Oriol and, and Zimor and how they were able to use this to get some better bounds for the M, M sum free case. And he was like, if they could only get some better bounds for the three K minus four theorem, they would be able to, in, to improve the, the constant much better than what they could manage there. So I, I thought, well, perhaps we could. And that's where things started. And uh, they, they later finished up at the a different conference in, in, in India uh, just last year. Uh, and like I said, you know, you use the same Cauchy Davenport argument, you get a, a trivial upper bound or a very basic upper bound of one third, but it's going to be less. So here, here are the bounds that we could come up with. So re regarding the, the lower bound, right? Where we're going to get more than zero. Zero is uh, two. The case of two is kind of unusual because it's in some sense translation invariant and behaviors, if things for that behave differently. Once we get beyond back to three, you can get a bound of one eighth. Now, uh, this, this lower bound is actually a construction of, of Thomas Shin, or at least he was, he was, he had told Pablo about such a construction and he had nothing to do with it. So he, he graciously let us include it in the, the paper with his crediting him for it. Uh, and then the referee uh, took a look at uh, Sharon's construction and, and thought it could be improved a little and gave a suggestion for how to improve it. And we took a look at the referee's suggestion and realized that well, it nearly worked, but there were a few little technicalities with what they had suggested. Um, and we, with a little bit of effort, we were able to modify the, the idea of the referee, combine it with the idea of Sharon, and we were able to iron out that, that lower bound. This is all just really fine nuances here to, to get that one eighth. And there's still the, the, the crux of it is going back to sure. And so we get a, a lower bound of one eighth holding for any n, whether it's tight or not. And then there's some, we can do some for smaller values and some a slight differences there. But the upper bound was then the, the main crux, uh, the main uh, sort of uh, application of our result. And before, when they had that result of Freimer and uh, sorry, of Oreo and, and Zimor, they could get something over 1.3.0001, which is it was still beats the, the trivial bound or the, the basic bound of one third you get from Cauchy Davenport, but it was, was very close to one over three. And so we're, we're still kind of a long ways off from one over eight, but using our result, we can still push it away from one third. And we manage one over 1 1.3.1955. 3 uh, and it's not actually directly using the result I stated in this lecture, because remember that had a density three quarters. Uh, the density bound that we basically need uh, for applying it in this question over here is around uh, a third. So basically a third plus R divided by three or, or something like that, as I recall. And so we, we can simply weaken the density restriction a little and, and modify the calculations so we get a, a, a more relaxed small sums of hypothesis instead of having that uh, 3.14, we get it to 3.1955 instead. So that's where that number is coming from there. It's just because with a, we only need a, we don't need that full power of the three quarters density. We can actually restrict the density a little 
And when we strengthen the density hypothesis, we can relax the small sum that hypothesis in sort of a, as a tug back between the two of them. And that's what comes out of this over here. And so that's all I really wanted to talk about uh, coming towards the end of the presentation here. So thank you again for letting me talk here. Happy birthday. And I'll be happy to answer any questions in, in the meantime. Although I do have to give a test uh, not too much longer after here, but uh, I'm, I'm free for the time being. So that's all. Okay, any question? <laughs> Very hard to think of stuff with that remotely. No, uh, any question? Sukuma, so, some people have raised their hands. Yeah, I cannot see. Yeah. And if you look at the participant, you'll see the hands. Yeah. So, yeah, where is that? Can you help me? Can who all of, I cannot see. No, they, they have disappeared. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no hands are up now. Yeah. They were clapping hands. Sometimes people have like a, a clapping hand um, emoji gun and it looks like a hand. But uh, yes. <laughs> but we can tell anybody has question can go ahead. Do we can see? Oh, no. Okay. Okay. If not, let us thank the speaker again. Yes. That's difficult online, but we'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, hello, then we wait 10 minutes. Right. There are 10 minutes. Okay, then it's time for a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, the new studio. Very good.
Our next speaker is Professor George Andrews from Pennsylvania State University. And he is he will be talking on how Ramarujan may have discovered the mock theta function. Professor Andrews. Thank you very much, Professor Adhikari. Thanks to all the organizers. Happy birthday to Balu. It's a great pleasure to have the honor of speaking at this conference. Uh, also, I express my deep appreciation to all the people in India who are obviously staying up very late in order to hear this talk. And I thank the organizers for making it such that I could have it at a very comfortable time of the morning on the East Coast of the United States. So what I'm going to talk about is the one of the things that is Ramanujan is quite famous for, namely this discovery of the mock theta functions. And one of the mysteries in, in thinking about this is how in the world, why in the world would he have thought this up? It's going to be necessary in this talk to, so to speak, get down in the weeds and uh, generally talks for a general audience down in the weeds, I have uh, leave something to be desired. But I do think this is an, a significant question and it will be hard to communicate the, how he did this without really getting, uh, getting our hands dirty. At least I hope at the beginning to do some prototype examples so that you can basically get a feeling for how this might have happened. Also, I have to apologize as I look through my slides this morning, I realized that there are a number of typos and the first typo appears on the second slide. This is not from, well, it is from page 127 of the published version of Ramanujan's Lost Notebook, but it gives the, the title gives the impression that it is from his Lost Notebook. It's actually part of the last letter that he sent to G. H. Hardy in 1920. Since I have such a large Indian audience, I won't tell you the story of Ramanujan's life, just to remind you that he, uh, as a, an Indian without many, many financial resources, was befriended by G. H. Hardy, who went to England in 1914, worked on numerous projects with Hardy, writing really papers that had tremendous influence on the research in number theory and related topics through the 20th century. He got ill and unfortunately convalesced in England and it was thought he might, his health might improve if they returned to India, which he did in 1919 and fortunately his health got worse and he died in April of 1920. In January of 1920, he wrote a letter to Hardy and this letter says, Hardy noted, said nothing about his health, but only talked about what he said were some very interesting functions recently, which I call mock theta functions. Now, uh, depending on the resolution of your computer, you may or may not be able to make out much of anything on this page. So let me, write it out in a form that is somewhat easier to read. At the, at the top of the page, it starts, if we consider a theta function in transformed Eulerian form, and by Eulerian form, he means what we now call Q series or basic hypergeometric series, where you have these rising Q factorials, one minus Q, one minus Q squared, one minus Q cubed, et cetera. And he focuses on two of these series, the first one is, um, is turns out to be the, the series that Jacobi actually needed in order to prove Jacobi's triple product. The second one is the series from the first rogers ramanujan identity. Ramanujan notes that it is possible to determine the nature of the singularities at the points, and here, in other words, at the roots of unity on the unit circle. Uh, please forgive my cuckoo clock <laughs> that is cuckooing in the background. Uh, 
these are the points on the unit circle. And he remarks that we know how beautifully the asymptotic form of this, these functions can be expressed in very neat closed exponential form. And the reason for that is if you rewrite A and B succinctly, as I've done here, where the notation is the class standard Q notation for these finite Q Pachhammer symbols, then the first series A, namely the thing that you see at the top of the screen there, and B, which I have written out more extensively here, the A is equal to the generating function for P of N, the number of partitions of N. It's effectively the modulo a multiplier. It's the reciprocal of the Dedekindata function. It's a modular form. B, on the right-hand side, you have another effect, a modular function, again, uh, transforming under a different modular group. But nonetheless, the nifty asymptotics that Ramanujan describes in his letter that are given in the middle of the page, and which is what he is most concentrating on as, as what's nifty about theta functions, the asymptotics there are all produced by the representation on the right-hand side. One can get some asymptotics for the behavior uh, util utilizing things like the saddle point method, looking at the left-hand side, but the right-hand side is where you get this truly uh, amazing uh, uh, clarity of the exponential nature of the singularity. Ramanujan then proceeds to speculate about the possibility of the functions that one, behave beautifully near the unit circle, and two, are not theta functions, or as we might say, modular forms. While Ramanujan says he's not proved the existence of such functions, he nonetheless lists 17 functions, which, we, which he firmly believes are these new functions, which he terms mock theta functions. So now I've come to my second, second typo of the morning. The top line, every minus sign you see in the line defining F3 of Q should be a plus sign. So this series should read one plus Q over one plus Q quantity squared, and then one plus Q squared squared, one plus Q squared squared. All the minus signs in the top row should be a plus. Otherwise, everything is correct here. So Ramanujan lists these three functions in his letter to Hardy, and he makes the following assertions about them. And the thing that you are should be have noted for you is that these linear combinations that he has made up are equal to, if you look at the bottom of the screen, equal to a classical theta function, theta four, times a classical uh, infinite product, which is basically an eta quotient, so that the right-hand side is a modular form, whereas he's asserting that the while the F, T, and C are not modular forms, these linear combinations produce modular forms. But what would have given Ramanujan the idea that such functions might be possible? In addition, why latch on to these three? I mean, of course, if you look at the three of them, they look very much like A and B. And so you say, well, okay, fine. But these, the behavior of these functions is very rare. If you write down, Ramanujan gives an example of one that looks like all of these, where the behavior near the unit circle is not nice at all. And it would be a true statement that if you sort of write down such a series randomly, it, the probability is close to 100% that you're going to have some function that is not either the in Ramanujan's no, notation, a classical theta function or a, uh, a, a mock theta function. So this is the main topic of the talk this morning, what would have given him the idea. So I believe that Ramanujan's study of identities like the Heine transformation, which he did not, I do not believe knew it was the Heine transformation. He undoubtedly had it, although it's not it's not in full generality in his writings. There are enough special cases of it that one would believe that he had it. And I believe that this sort of thing led him to discover the mock theta function. 
So in order to understand what I'm getting at, I'm going to actually give you a proof of this transformation due to Heine back in the middle of the 19th century. And it relies on a very much simpler formula, namely what is called the Q binomial series. And it is the assertion that this infinite series equals the infinite product here. And he uses that series and he uses a way of writing, and here's the next, next typo, the capital N on the bottom line should be a little n. He rewrites his finite products as taking the full infinite product and then canceling out every term starting with the nth term and beyond so that you write a finite product as a quotient of two infinite products. This seems at first glance to be somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, it seems like you're uh, not reducing entropy, but increasing it. But surprisingly, this works extremely well. So let's see how, to, how the proof goes. So here's, as you see, is the left-hand side. And what have I done? I've taken the B product and the C product and rewritten them as the quotient of two infinite products. Of course, the part of the, inf the one infinite product that does not involve the index n, it can then be factored out. And so we're left with a series that looks like this. So this is the crucial idea. What you do now is to look at this infinite product right here and utilize the Q binomial series in order to expand it into an infinite series. And so this is precisely what is done in the next line. And then you interchange the order of summation. Of course, we need, uh, uh, we need conditions in order to guarantee the absolute convergence of all, all the series involved so that this is legitimate. All those conditions are easily supplied, but they will distract from the flow of the argument, which is what I want to emphasize. So all that's happened in the third line is the exchange of the order of summation. But the exchange of order of summation produces another instance on the interior, the n sum is now another instance of the Q binomial series, so that you can sum it now into an infinite product by using the, the uh, Q binomial series formula to take that infinite series into an infinite product. And now you see you have. <coughs> You have one of the infinite products related to the expression that you see at the bottom of the screen here. And so you may now uh, factor it out and put in its place another infinite product and a finite product. And what you have at the bottom of the screen is precisely Heine, precisely Heine's transformation. So this is the full proof and the mechanism that you have seen here in how one proceeded from the upper left hand series to the expression at the bottom of the screen. This is something that clearly Ramanujan was not only familiar with, but able to execute in circumstances that were, are somewhat more challenging than Heine's transformation. But at least the one message I want to get over that what I believe to be true is it is Ramanujan's facility in dealing with identities of this nature that led him to the mock theta functions. There is much more that is possible with this method as Ramanujan clearly reveals in the lost notebook. For example, I write down here one such formula and it again is proved in exactly the way that I proved this before. Oh, and uh, here is a further example. Uh, both of these say appear on page three of Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. The first one is, is right at the bottom of the screen. Uh, part of your reason for not <laughs> seeing this too clearly is there's a lot packed onto each page. Also, Ramanujan seldom wrote with the modern capital sigma notation. 
he generally wrote down three terms of an infinite series. And since no exponent was worse than quadratic, three terms of an infinite series completely determined the infinite series. And so you were able to see these formulas. But here, for example, are two examples, each proved in that way. Here are two or three more. Again, uh, each of them is proved in exactly the same way, just utilizing the binomial series and this way of changing finite products into a quotient of infinite products. There's a certain surprise with respect to the last formula here in that all of a sudden you have two series on the right. How in the world did that happen? So I'm gonna take the last series, this series that you see on the left. I'm not gonna go through the entire proof of this, but I am going to indicate how that happens because that sort of thing I need need you to see how this can arise, how this can bifurcate into two series as because this is what happens in what I suggest is Ramanujan's discovery voyage for the Mach theta functions. So to start with, we take the series on the left and we change this finite product in the numerator, AQ, Q sub N, into a quotient of two infinite products. And now we use the Q binomial series in the limiting case where the top parameter is zero, we use it to determine a infinite series for the infinite product a q to the n plus one q. And we proceed from there to now interchange the order of summation. The, n, the series on n is now a further instance of the, the Q binomial series. However, it's a limiting case so that you actually get this quadratic exponent in the numerator. The formula that we're using to sum it actually goes back to Euler. So Euler had two instances of the Q binomial series. And what the, this series on the end sums to is the infinite product that you see here. Now, this product is going to be infinite pro an infinite product of the form one plus Q to an integer power, but it will depend on whether e M, if M is even, the, all the powers on M in the product will be odd. And if M is odd, all the powers in the product will be even. So it will have a dramatic effect on what the product is like, whether M is odd or even. And consequently, what you do is to separate it into two parts according to M even in the first case or M odd in the second. And now you're able to proceed in the way that one saw before. It is now possible. I won't carry you through the rest of the proof, uh, because, but what I wanted to show you is that the effect right here at the bottom of the screen forces one to look at two series rather than one because of the different behavior produced by the exponent being odd or even. So we have now returned to series A, okay? Let us recall series A because that is with in right after the introductory sentence, that's the first thing that Ramanujan looked at is this infinite series. And I suggest to you that one of the things that might have intrigued Ramanujan <clears throat> would be, could I play, could I operate with the Heine method on this infinite series? And the answer, at least as it stands now, is no. Because if we want to apply a Heine type transformation to this with Q to the N squared in the numerator, we need Q squared, Q squared sub N in the denominator. If we had a Q squared instead of the square on the outside of this product, if the squares were on the Qs in the inside, then we could proceed, but we don't have that. Well, Ramanujan, not to be deterred, I suggest, said, why don't I rig it? So I will put that product there, and then I will cancel out factors 
in order to make this an identity. And so the only thing going on here is the old algebra idea that one minus x squared is one minus x times one plus x. And so one minus q to the two j is one minus q to the j times one plus q to the j. And so Ramana cancel out, cancels out the plus factors with this numerator product. And so now changing the original A series into this form, Ramanujan with his incredible curiosity is going to proceed to see what happens. So he does, if, um, if my, so everything I'm saying here is conjecture. So if I say Ramanujan thought this, what I'm really saying is I'm guessing Ramanujan thought this. But <clears throat> what, what happens here then is the procedure just like we did in Heine's theorem, namely, you replace these two finite products by a quotient. Uh, each one of them is a quotient of two infinite products so that the series now becomes this, all right? Now, you have right inside here something that is amenable to the Q binomial series. All right, so that's what, <clears throat> that's what you get for the Q binomial series. And now, what do you do? What the, this, everything from here on is almost algorithmic. Not quite, but almost. You interchange the order of summation and you sum the n sum. And the n sum is, again, by limiting case of the Q binomial series, it's this infinite product. <coughs> well, the reason I chose the example, other example from the, well, there are a couple of reasons I chose the other example from the lost notebook, but one reason I chose it was to show you that in order to proceed with something like this, you have to bifurcate the series according to whether M is even or odd. So <clears throat> what we obtain now by taking M first even and M odd is the, ex the two expressions that you see here uh, multiplied by the infinite products out front. So our original series that Ramanujan was so emphasizing in his letter on the mock data function, this series has now been deformed into what you see here. Now, one might feel that things are not going well because you have gone from a very simple series to a mixture of two rather complicated infinite series and infinite products, but there's still, there are still many possibilities. So although we have not seen much entropy reduction here, nonetheless, we can perform the same operation of reversing things that we saw in the Heine transformation. And consequently, we can rewrite the two infinite series in the manner that you see here, getting all the infinite products outside of the series. And what remains in the series are finite products. But what is particularly neat is that cancellation has occurred. In other words, the, the, the infinite product that you see here, when it's pulled out, part of it is glues on to the finite product in here to give this infinite product, leaving this remainder of what is there, and the denominator is, stays just as it is. So this is different from what happened in tri Finus transformation, and obviously Ramanujan was watching out for it and took advantage of it. And similarly, in the second line, this pulls out uh, from these, these factors, the, the even parts, and leaves him with this. And where does this go from here? Well, the reason that I rewrite things in the in the form that you see down here is because uh, <clears throat> the I put a zero, I put an a, a phantom finite product in the numerator of 
the two series above, and I've split the denominator factors into two parts on modulus q squared. In other words, I split the exponents that are even from the exponents that are odd in each of these series. And, and the reason I do that is to show that what I have on the screen is two instances of the Highness series itself. The, the, the base is not Q any longer, it's Q squared. But this is, both of these are Highness series. And so we can apply Highness transformation to them. So that will take, would take several more slides. And uh, I'm hoping that I can end the talk a little early because I recognize that many of you are fighting sleep, I hope successfully. And so I want to, I want to, sort of hit the highlights of what's going on. So we've, we've already seen highness transformation. Each of the two final series is a series of this form. Once you apply Heine and do a variety of simplifications, the whole thing boils down to this, namely the left-hand side. Remember the left-hand side is just that, that we see there which is, if you recall my initial slides, I don't want to go back through all of those, initial slides, this is one over QQ infinity. It's the, it's the generating function for P of N. And so what you have are a bunch of infinite products. All the infinite products, incidentally, are modular forms, and you have these two series. So let me summarize everything. There is a famous, uh, identity, I believe, going back to Gauss, but maybe Jacobi. I'm not sure which, and never have been sure which. Anyway, this is the theta four series, and if you use it to simplify the expressions here, this is what you obtain. And I won't go back to the original slide, but I will tell you that this is the one of the. This is the phi mock theta function, this is the psi mock theta function. The threes have been introduced in the printed version, the edited version of the lost notebook that Bruce Berndt and I collaborated on, which takes five volumes. We put three on, the, on these to designate that they're the third order mock theta functions. But what you obtain is this really strikingly simple identity, even though the proof that we went through started out from this formula for one over q, q infinity, and you simplifies to that. I claim that this is the aha moment. This is, I believe that when Ramanujan saw this formula that we see in the middle of the screen here, his eyes would have lit up because these series do not behave in any sort of uniform manner at all the roots of unity on the unit circle. Namely, where certain roots of unity, they head to some value other than, other than uh, one that will make the denominator singular, make the expression singular, so that although and each of these roots of unity is an essential singularity for these functions, the radial approach <coughs> to them does not, does not tend to infinity. At certain roots of unity, phi three of minus q remains bounded as q tends to rho. At others, it, it has to behave exactly like the left-hand side because when one of them is remaining finite as Q radially approaches that value on the boundary, the other one has to then behave asymptotically precisely like this because the difference between the two of them is bounded. Now it's not difficult to show that the limits are, uh, the bounded limits are easily proved. I'm just gonna take the simplest example namely the phi three of minus Q as Q tends to one from the left. 
I claim this is equal to minus one. And the sort of proof I'm giving will is easily adapted to deal with any of the other cases. Namely, you split the series into two parts, uh, n equal one to capital N and then capital N plus one to infinity. And from N goes from one to capital N, as Q tends to one from the left, the, each term in the series becomes minus one to the N over two to the N. And it's the finite geometric series, which sums to the expression you see there. The second term, you can easily show that the terms are bounded. And here's another typo, bounded by two raised to the nth power. Sorry about that. And consequently, the, the tail of the series uh, tends to zero as capital N tends to infinity, and the limit is easily proved. So that, I believe, is the, so to speak, aha moment. Now, given Ramanujan's fertile imagination and, and, and appreciation of the things that might be possible, um, he would naturally, so the things we've dealt with really are this, this mock theta functions phi and c, which you'll notice that he lists first, uh, well, he lists first after discussing discussion of this function f, but f is wait a minute. So f three is this series. So as I re you recall, I had some errors before, but now this is correct, where where you have this series. <coughs> Instead of q q sub n, you have minus q q sub n, and you can go through exactly the same argument that I went through with the original series, and you will wind up with this. And from this, the relevant identities follow. The relevant identities are the ones I've showed you, or the ones right in the middle of this slide. But Ramanujan does not stop here, <coughs> and I believe that. Excuse me. Ronichin does not stop here, and I believe that the, the methods that involved intrigued him with series B, which was the, the first identity in the rogers Ramanujan identities. And here are four more mock theta functions. Actually, there are five of them, and there's the fifth one. And there is a second family of fifth order mock theta functions that he lists on this screen. Let me suggest to you where those came from. So consider an identity from the lost notebook that we, well, we sketched the proof of it earlier. We didn't carry it out in full. But what happens when you set A equal minus one in this? When you set equal minus one, the series on the left becomes the series in the rogers ramanujan identities. And when you said A equal one, it becomes Ramanujan's F of Q right here, the first of the fifth order mock theta function. Actually, it's, it's this F of Q. And the next one, of course, is, is related to the second rogers ramanujan identity. And these sorts of identities that you see here with a equal minus one and a equal one are producing the identities that can, from which you can deduce the things that Ramanujan sent to Hardy. So this, <clears throat> not only does this argument set up the, uh, show you the aha moment, show you the reason that you would think these series are significant, but would, uh, would lead you to, I believe, all of the formulas that Ramanujan found. Um, the, the behavior, the reason that you get this wonderful mock theta function behavior is precisely because of this, this behavior near the unit circle. And so once he saw that, then he realized that if these functions weren't 
some sort of modular form, they behaved in really this radical way of, in effect, half the time they're behaving exactly like a modular form, and the other half the time they are bounded as they approach the unit circle. And I, it seems to me very likely that this is the case. So in the last letter to Hardy, and this is the, these are the last two pages of the last letter to Hardy, and indeed they uh, occur, they were published, uh, Hardy published them in the collected papers of Ramanujan. So everybody had a chance to see them uh, from, uh, from the mid twenties onward. Besides these functions here and from, there at the bottom of the slide, it says mock data functions of seventh order, and he lists three more series. And the last words, which are not shown here, but are written at the bottom of the letter is, these three functions are not related to each other. And so you have, you have zero indication of why he thought they were seventh order functions. So I've shown you this set of things. I ask about what, what can one say about the seventh order functions? And the answer is, so far as what Ramanujan has, it is a giant question mark. I should say a little more about the fifth order functions. Uh, Watson using a, a much more, so to speak, uh, intricate, technique was able to determine the behavior of these, these third order functions near the unit circle. Uh, his paper in 1937, the final problem in account of the mock data functions well explains this, but it uses things that do not apply at all to the fifth order functions and consequently Watson in a second paper on the fifth order functions proves all the identities that Ramanujan has, but states that it looked to him like you, he didn't, he was very leery of the full definition of mock data function here because he could not find formulas as he found for the third order functions that would allow him to make the same sort of asymptotic observations, not close to the asymptotic observations that Ramanujan was really requiring in order to call something a mock data function. So one of the most exciting things about discovering the lost notebook was to find in the lost notebook, all of these functions. So the, it was clear that when Ramanujan wrote the pages that could, that make up the lost notebook, namely right when in the last year of his life. And he has all the neat formulas that Watson found for the third order functions that allowed Watson to prove their behavior near the unit circle. In addition, he has formulas that will allow it one to prove the behavior of the fifth order functions near the unit circle. In other words, he has formulas that Watson conjectured did not exist. So he had tremendous insight here. We have no idea how he came up with these formulas. He had to have some sort of, of understanding of things way beyond what he wrote down because it is not clear from what he wrote down why he would think that these things were mock data functions, yet he is absolutely 100% uh, uh, convinced of their behavior. Um, and it should po be pointed out that the, the discoveries of the last part of the 20th century and now into the 21st century have not only shown that all of these functions, not only the fifth order ones and the third order, but also the seventh order, have exactly this behavior. Uh, Ken Ono and his colleagues have done immense amounts in connecting 
the Mach theta functions with uh, weak harm harmonic weak mass forms. Uh, Zander Svegers is probably the pioneer in making these sorts of observations. And uh, so a, there's been an explosion of applications of the Mach theta functions. But it's always seemed to me to have been an important question of where did these come from? And hopefully points to the fact that Ramanujan may well have been on to something in looking at these functions in terms of, uh, of these Eulerian or basic series. And there is really lots more to be done into fully understanding that aspect of Mach theta functions. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I realize that it's late. And so I think I'm 10 minutes early in ending. I would be happy to answer any questions for all of you who are still awake. Okay, thank you, Professor Andrews, for this nice talk. Uh, I cannot see who is anybody doing a hand, but please uh, ask and if anybody has any question. Well, uh, uh, I have a, a, a very naive question. Um, okay. It has to do a lot with um, uh, minus one square is, is equal to one. Yes. So, but not with uh, um, the cube root of unity. Okay. Um, is there something special or is it that it's irrelevant? I mean, there's something special about minus one uh so so basically the the instances that i showed you uh the minus one was so to speak the easiest example to to point to but but the same observations apply to all roots of unity and indeed at least one of the uh, of the third order functions which i didn't talk about the cube roots of unity are much more important so that uh that the I, I I tried in this talk to just sort of concentrate on one thing that I could get over, but there is lots more going on that I have uh, sort of brushed aside for purposes of whatever clarity I could give in something that was as down in the weeds as this. Well, no, no, no. Thank you. I was wondering why we had some sum and some product at the end. And that you made very clear what, what was happening. And, and then I had this question about uh, cube roots yep. and so on. Thank you. The broader picture, the cube roots are in, in play as important a role. Sorry, I have to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. And Thank you, everybody. So we thank all the speakers of today, in fact. So, good night. Yes. Good I'll night. do it. <laughs> <laughs> and let us thank Adhikari sir and also all the speakers yes. of this session and all the sessions and all the chairs. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so, we meet at 1400 tomorrow in Indian time. So IST, 1400 IST. Thank you. Savli, uh, yeah, this is Ravi here. Yeah, hi. Hi. So, so I should just join the Zoom call early tomorrow? Yes, that was a session. I had sent a link. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, so yeah. I should just join it maybe at 140 or something, 20 yeah, minutes. We'll before. be there. We'll be there. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. See you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.